So let me first um, start by introducing myself again. This is Jamie Mulkey. I'm the Vice President of Test Development Services for Cabion. And I'd like to introduce our two presenters today. They are Dr. Mika Hoffman. She is the Executive Director for the Center of Education Measurement at Excelsior College. And also Dr. Larry Redner, who is the Vice President and Chief Psychometrician for Research and Development at GMAC, the Graduate Management Admissions Council. So we're very fortunate to have them today to be talking about considerations for online assessment program design. As I mentioned earlier, um, if you do have questions, please go ahead and uh, send a chat message to me. And then as the presenters are presenting, I will um, uh, interrupt the presenter and let them know we have a question. So let me turn this over now to Mika Hoffman. Mika? Good morning or afternoon, whatever it is where you are. Um, so as Jamie mentioned, I'm with Excelsior College, and we have an online assessment program. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, academic assessment in particular. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, um, just to give you a sense of what I'll talk about I'm going to talk about types of academic assessment, the intersection between the different types of assessment and the different stakes, a little bit about validity in a broad sense, and then go into sort of how that works out in planning, proctoring, the operational side of how you put a test program to get an online test program together. Um, and I'll finish with just a brief example of how what our program does. Next, please. Okay, so we're looking at different types of academic assessment. Many of you may be familiar with this. Many of you may not. Just thought I'd start out by setting the background. So there's diagnostic assessment. This is used to figure out what people's strengths and weaknesses are, uh, how to put them in a section or a course. Really what that's about is trying to identify the academic skills that you're interested in and where people fall on the spectrum. It's not necessarily there's a right answer and a wrong answer. It's just trying to get information. The next type of academic assessment um, that we talk about, um, if I could have the next bit of this slide, is formative assessment. And this is your weekly vocabulary quiz may fall into this uh, kind of assessment. And it's designed to provide feedback to students, and I should add to the instructors, who can then figure out what do I need to spend more time on in class? Um, and it also identifies strengths and weaknesses. The, the purpose of this assessment is not strictly to say, does the person know it or not, and let's give them a grade. But the, the ultimate goal of formative assessment is, how can we make sure that the student reaches the ultimate goal, not necessarily are they there already. And then finally, summative assessment is the final outcome of learning. So that's your your final exam, uh, the large scale tests that are really trying to say, do you know this subject? So that's one way of dividing up the pie of different types of academic assessment. And on the next slide, we have, oh, sorry, the, the, we're going to ask you just to find a way um, what kinds of assessments are you involved with. I'm trying to get a sense for where you all are coming from. So um, I'm watching the polls come in, and this is good. A lot of people are responding. For this particular question, you can select all that apply, and then we'll post the results to the screen. This is a way to kind of keep this, this webinar interactive and keep you engaged and, and also get a pulse with the audience. Okay, um, we're going to close the poll now and share the results. Mika, can you see the results? Yes, I can. Okay, so Great. it looks okay. like summative is, is uh, what most people are really working on, which I think for most of us involved in larger scale testing, that's mostly where it is. So this is not, this is not surprising. It's interesting to see diagnostic and formative kind of right there next to each other. Okay, great. Um, so let's move on. And now I want to talk about the stakes involved. So in addition to slicing up the pie with diagnostic, formative, and summative, you can look at 
the stakes, how important the results are. And this is, in some sense, a, a value judgment. Opinions can differ. Um, but in general, here's what I'd say. Low stakes would be a quiz with little impact on the grade, a self-assessment. Um, some of the diagnostic assessments might end up being low stakes. What's going to happen as a result of this test? What's the worst that could happen if the information from the test is incorrect? If in a low stakes environment, the worst that could happen is not really that terrible. It's something along the lines of maybe you have to switch sections of a class, or maybe you have to redo an assignment that you actually understood. Um, but it's the, the stakes are fairly low. Now, mid stakes is probably the hardest to define because it's always hardest to define the middle. But those might be tests with a substantial impact on the grade um, or something that would really get you out of a requirement. If, what would be the worst that could happen if the information on that test was wrong? Well, maybe you end up bypassing a requirement when you don't really know the material. That would probably have an impact on your future success. It's not, um, it's not as serious as failing a whole program, but it might lead to some difficulties. Um, or if the exam shows that you really do need to redo the requirement, maybe you have to repeat something and spend more money on tuition, um, which is not necessarily insignificant um, in the larger scheme of things, but it's kind of in the middle. And then finally, we have the high stakes tests, which I think are the ones most people have heard of. So the you know, entrance, entrance exams, are you going to get into the college or grad school that you want? Are you something that actually carries academic credit with it? Is this going to save you tuition dollars? Is this going to have an impact on how much money you have to pay overall? Um, is this going to determine whether you pass or fail the course? Those are certainly higher stakes. And I think there's there can be discussion about the relative weight of these stakes. Um, but the way I've set it up is kind of generally the way I think most people would divide the pie. And some of you may have different opinions about that, and I wouldn't be at all surprised. So the next thing we want to do is do another poll um, where we're going to kind of, again, get a sense for where you all fall on this idea of stakes. So you can see so, the poll question, I hope. Yes, it's what stakes are attached to a non-credit placement exam. Looks like the uh, people are, are voting. So we'll just take a couple more seconds here that people cast their votes. Okay, and we're going to close the, the poll and show, share our results. Okay, so that looks like MID got the most votes, and personally that's probably where I would put it. Um, but again, with a lot of these issues of stakes, sometimes there are differences of opinion, and it may depend on the particular kind of course that the placement is for. So maybe it's high stakes if it involves whether you get into the honors track somewhere, or maybe it's low stakes if it's, you know, are you in an easy French class or a more difficult one. So I think there's definitely a lot of other things that, that could impact it. So now let's go to the next uh, question. Let's t take a different type of exam. And this question is, what stakes are attached to an exam leading to a non-credit certificate for professional training? So you can go ahead and uh, uh, go ahead and vote on this one. And we'll take a few more seconds. People are still voting. All right. Let's sh we'll share the results of this one. Okay, and that one, again, mid is m more people falling in the middle, but there's more on the high end than the low end for this one. And again, I think that's, you can see that there might be pay raises involved, there might be professional advancement involved, so it might be a little higher. Now, the reason I had those questions 
is not so much so that we can all come to some kind of consensus about what stakes are attached to what test, but the whole context of everything I'm going to say after that is really to think about the situation of your particular test, what the stakes are, and all of that is going to color the way you look at validity, um, at how you put the test together, about the level of security that's required. The stakes really drive all that. Always be asking yourself, what's the worst that would happen if the test produced bad information? And that should be able to, to drive a lot of decisions about what you need to do with the test. So moving on to the next slide, um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about validity. And there are a lot of definitions of, of validity. There's a lot of academic dispute about this. For a sort of a lay perspective, an operational perspective, in, in the light of the stakes of the test, a test is valid if it gives us reasonable assurance that a person claiming to know the relevant academic material actually does know it. Um, and the converse would also be true, that if um, a person doesn't know it, then that should show up on the test too. So, and, and reasonable is my wiggle word with the, the, what defines reasonable is determined by the stakes of the test. So moving on, what does that mean for what you do to plan the test and, and put the whole thing together. So on the next slide, um, oh sorry, the next bullet is the, the various subcategories of that is what's the knowledge that you're interested in? Is that relevant to the academic subject? And those are two separate things. There are all kinds of knowledge you can test with a test, but you need to define what academic subject you're interested in and the particular content of that and not be worried about other kinds of knowledge that might be interesting but not related. And then who is it that has the knowledge? So those are the big three questions that, that need also to be in the forefront of your mind. So the next slide, um, obviously when you plan a test, you need to bear this in mind. And one of the things that I often find with academics, people who are in academics as opposed to people who are in testing, people who are in testing know about test planning. People who are in academia don't necessarily think all these th things through. So you need to be able to say, what is the knowledge? Is it relevant? What's the purpose of the assessment? What are, what are we trying to learn from all this? Now, when I say a test that's for all the marbles, that would be a summative assessment, a high stakes summative assessment along the lines of something that would be for academic credit, that might be a capstone exam that would uh, enable you to graduate from a program. Those are things that have to link up with a syllabus, with learning objectives. It ought to be very clear what's being covered there, and it has to cover the whole thing. For a weekly quiz, it obviously doesn't have to cover the whole syllabus of the course, but it should cover a defined portion of that. And you need to know what exactly you're trying to accomplish with this quiz. It shouldn't be the students expect the quiz every week. It should be, I hope this gives me some information. What is it giving me information about? So again, you need to always be thinking about how you plan. That goes into everything else that moves on. Now going on to the next slide. Um, Security is also something that everyone should bear in mind all the time. Now, maybe for your weekly quiz, you aren't too worried about security. You're not going to necessarily make people go through keystroke analysis and interrupt the quiz with personal questions that only they can answer and uh, you know, have a, an individual proctor leaning over their shoulder or whatever. Um, but you do need to bear in mind what kind of security do I need for the stakes of the test. And security isn't just about the proctoring. When you're dealing with a high stakes test, particularly a high stakes summative test that has a lot of test items on it, it's not just is the person looking at their iPad while they're taking the test, but it's are they transmitting the contents of the test elsewhere? Are the people reviewing your test transmitting the contents elsewhere? Could a hacker get in and find the contents of your test as you're emailing items back and forth, which I hope you wouldn't be if you're doing a high stakes test. Um, and then just to emphasize the point, security is related to validity. For those of you in the testing business, it, this may be obvious, but if you don't know how people got the information and if what they're, what they're 
regurgitating on the test is what they've memorized from having seen the thing up on the web, you're not really testing what you want to test. So it's, again, for a low stakes test, you may be able to live with that and people may be less tempted to find the answers through some method under the, other than knowing the material. But it's very important for a high stakes test to make sure you know where those answers are coming from. Okay, so moving along, I want to talk a little bit more about proctoring. Um, it's both proctoring and identity verification together. I see these as two sides of the same coin. You need to sit, you need to know who these people are, and then you have to keep an eye on them to make sure they're still who they are and they didn't change into somebody else. Now, on online testing, this can happen. Somebody can sign in, and then their friend comes in and actually is the one who takes the, the test, um, or somebody signs in with a fake ID, you need to make sure that the person is who they say they are and that they are, remain that person, that they're not using other aids. So proctoring goes beyond identity, identity verification. Obviously, you want to make sure they're not cheating. And you need to make sure the test content is secure. As I said, not only are they not using their phone to look for answers, but they're not using their phone to send those answers somewhere else. Moving along. Um, I'm going to talk just about what we do. So again, we're, we're in the high stakes business. Our exams are the equivalent of college credit. So what we do is we build these, all the marbles exams that are designed to stand alone. You, there are no other exams. There's no midterm. There are no weekly quizzes. In order to, de to determine if someone deserves credit for this course, they need to take this exam and that's it. So we need to make sure that they're very reflective of the curriculum, that they're very secure, that they're really measuring what they need to be measuring. So we have a test plan. We have a committee with testing experts and people teaching the, the subject to come up with what the content should be on the exam. This is a two or three day process where, where we hammer all this out. Then we write the exam. We, we have reviewers. We have writers. We also have practice exams. So we don't just do high stakes exams. We consider our practice exams to be mid stakes. No grades are attached to it. They're really for the student's benefit to make sure that they know what they think they do. So those are delivered online and it's just username password verification. They, they aren't necessarily who they say they are, but there's not a whole lot of motivation to cheat on those because there's no particular stakes attached to the exam. Then the final exam that really does count for credit, that's done in person at Pearson View Testing Centers. We sort of have a very high level of security there because we want to make sure that the content doesn't get out there. Um, so that's, again, that just encompasses what I've talked about in, in the whole presentation there. When we have our online assessment program, we're looking at aspects of online identity. We're looking at what you need to do to make sure that the test is secure when everything we do is electronic. Um, we don't email items back and forth, for one thing. Um, but what I wanted to emphasize here is that all of this security considerations is really tied up with validity and has to be part of every step of the test development process from deciding the purpose of the test to its final administration. So Any now what we'd like so to do, yeah, come in. yeah, um, and the way that you'll ask questions is by sending me a chat, and then I will relay that question to Mika. So the, the microphones will not be opened up; everyone is still muted. So, are there any questions for Mika? There will be chances to ask more questions at the very end too, after you've had a chance to get more into the details with Larry. Okay, I see no questions coming up. Oh, I do have one. Let's see. Um, okay, it's a personal problem. I'll take care of that one. Uh, why don't we move along to um, Dr. Larry Rudner now. And he's going to be talking about understanding test development in psychometricians. So, uh, Larry, I'm going to turn this over to you. Very good. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. I was having technical problems earlier. I'm sorry. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay. I'm going to be talking about building a quality test, marks of quality, and sources of error. Uh, 
I must preface that I'm a psychometrician and we feel as we are a misunderstood lot. People don't take us out for lunch very often. They don't appreciate the science that's behind what we do. So what I hope to do today is make you all apprentice psychometricians. Together we'll go through a little item analysis and we'll be looking at some of the things that psychometricians worry about. Again, my goal is for you to take a psychometrician out to lunch after me. Next slide, please. What we are good for as a psychometrician is to help you build a quality instrument. So my first question for you to think about is why do we care about test quality? And perhaps it's helpful to think about this in the negative. What happens if you don't have test quality? I have great plans for the technology, but it's kind of failing me. So I'm going to have to answer my own question. And that is, it's all about fairness and brand. And can we have the next slide, please? Okay. These, this slide are findings from the courts of the United States about obligations of test publishers of all sorts with regard to their instruments. They have an obligation to protect their brand, and they have an obligation to provide quality instruments for everybody. If they have been in the negative, some people have an unfair advantage, then what good is that degree? And what, does they, what good are you as a, uh, an organization? So it's critical. So to develop quality instruments, we go through a pretty standardized test development process. Next slide, please. We start off with identifying the desired content and then developing test specifications that are quite detailed. Now, if you think about many faculty developed tests, and the complaints you get from the students afterwards, they didn't test the right content. Often they'll say, well, this is a hard topic, hard question, so I'll throw that in there, or this is super easy, I'll throw that in there, without really going through and identifying what is critical, what's important to be, to be measured. We then go through an item development process. There's a, a science behind that where there's certain rules that are obvious and others that are not, for example, you have a multiple choice question. You don't want one of the options to be really long and all the others to be pretty short, because then you know the right answer is that long one that went to great pains to be accurate. And there's a whole lot of things like that. Items are then reviewed, one for technical quality and then two for, uh, for bias and, and offensiveness. Uh, offensiveness may not come up as uh, affecting the results, but it does put people at a disadvantage. Uh, if you have people spending a lot of time or any, even any time thinking about something that's not relevant to, relevant to the testing situation, you're, un, you're penalizing them. So there's a human review that goes through that. We then pilot test questions. That is, we, we test them out to see how they actually work. Uh, for the GMAT exam, we randomly mix a bunch of questions in the exam live. So our test takers are quite motivated to do well, and they can't identify which questions are the pilot questions. Psychometricians love data, and that's what comes out of the pilot test. And I will be doing a little bit of that. That's the item analysis. We're looking for stories in the data that help us understand how well the test question is working. Does it do a good job of differentiating examinees that know the material and don't know the material? Are there undue uh, biases against one group or another group. Once we have a collection of good questions, we are now in a position to develop our test forms. Typically, we want multiple forms, and that's true for an online test, especially because you don't know where your old form has been and you don't know what people are talking about. Uh, for the GMAT, we have a computer adapted test, so we're developing new forms and new pools constantly. And then you go administer them. And then you take a look at what questions have been used, what haven't been used, and then the psychometric cycle just continues on and on. It's a lengthy process, but the end result is a quality instrument. So let's look at a couple of indicators of quality. Next slide, please. Anytime you give a test, there's going to be variations. People are sleepy, they're not paying attention. Uh, maybe you didn't do the best job sampling the content. Uh, maybe the wording of the question isn't very good or it's misleading. But the point is, every time you give a test to somebody, their score is going to fluctuate a little bit. And that fluctuation is, we call that error. 
And what I'm showing here on this chart is one person who's taken the test a thousand times. They didn't learn anything in between administrations. Clear this person's hypothetical. And there's a bunch of variation in his score. Now let's look at person B. Now this person uh, has taken the test again a thousand times, and their scores don't fluctuate as much. So you might look at this and say, oh, we've better do something. Our test isn't very good for person A. That person's scores are all over the place. Uh, for our exam, for the GMAT, that is true because we're interested in rank ordering people across that ability continuum. But in uh, pass-fail situations, uh, if your passing score is above anywhere that's the credible range for person A, it doesn't matter. That person's going to fail. So you don't really need a highly reliable test at the low end. But if that passing score is real close to where person B is, you want a very, very reliable instrument. So here, the point about reliability is it's going to be a function, the needed reliability is going to be a function of how you use the test. Next slide, please. Hey, Larry. Um, let me interrupt you for a second. Um, we are getting a little bit of feedback. If you can speak up a little bit. That would be helpful. I also noticed there were um, a few questions in the, the question pool, and, and they relate to um, stakes of tests. So if that's OK, I think we will um, put that off towards the end of the presentation and, and let Larry talk about um, continue on with his presentation for now. OK. I just realized I had my speaker on in the background. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully the quality will be better. Here's a chart that relates test score on the x-axis with success on the y-axis. And we like to think we develop quality instruments so as test scores go up, so does the, the success factor. Uh, you can think of a, a passing score as indicator of success, but here I'm in, interested in true success, not theoretical success. So click the next button, please. Uh, we often summarize validity with a reliability, with a, a validity coefficient, which is basically a correlation, or it might be a multiple correlation, relating the test score to success. Uh, but I'd like to think about it a little bit differently, uh, especially as we start talking about online assessments where we're making pass-fail decisions. So let's suppose there's a certain level above which people are masters and below which people are non-masters. Now let's give our test and let's have a, a passing score. Next button, please. And you'll notice this upper right-hand quadrant. These are people that passed and should have passed. They deserve to pass their true successes. And just below that quadrant, the lower right, we've got people who failed that shouldn't fail. Now from a test publisher point of view or an admissions point of view, you want to maximize that ratio. That is, you want to minimize the number of failures and maximize the number of true, true people that you admit that succeed in the program. But if you look a little bit to the left of that upper left-hand quadrant, you see a whole lot of stars. Those are people that would have succeeded. Okay, now, here's your, the challenge is to set up a cut score so that the, you, you're balancing off the true successes against those who would have, who deserved to pass, but didn't pass. So there's a couple of approaches. You can make a higher quality instrument where the scatter is far less. You can lower your cut score, but then you have to recognize you're now going to be admitting or passing some people that maybe shouldn't have passed. So there's a whole science and a whole process that, that can be gone through to help you identify where to set those cut scores. You can have the next slide, please. Yeah, here's item analysis. What I've done is I've taken the entire score group and divided it up into four equal size people, equal size groups. Group one scored the lowest on the test, and group four scored the highest. And within each group, what percentage of people get the question correct? So if you look at this question 90, uh, people in the lowest score group score group one, about 25% got the question correct. And it goes up as ability goes up, and people in the top score group have a very high likelihood of getting the question correct. So hopeful this is the concept. Now this is a multiple choice test, so there are multiple options. And what would you expect, uh, don't click yet, what would you expect uh, to be the curve for the incorrect options? 
Well, the answer to that is you'd expect it to go high on the left and lower on the right. So click, please. So this is an actual question. Sure enough, the less able people are more likely to pick the incorrect option than the most able people in group four. And just to round this out, we have four options on the test. So one more click. And uh, what I, you'll see in my notation, there's a star by the correct answer. So now let's look at the next question. Here's going to be my first poll for you. What do you think about this question? And if you notice, the green is the correct response, and then you've got three incorrect responses. And can we have our poll, please? Okay, so make sure you guys take a good look at this. We're going to launch the poll. And we'll have people vote. And we're going to do this several times. So if you didn't get a good look at this um, item statistic for this item, um, we'll get to do it again. So the, poll, the uh, votes are still coming in. All right, we're going to go ahead and close, and I'll share the results. Oh, good. The right answer is looks good but could be better, and a good 51% of you picked that. Can you go back to the, back to the slides? Yeah, I bet. Okay. Uh, the, the green shows that as people are more capable, they're more likely to get the question correct. Option four has a nice downward slope, but nobody is picking options uh, three and what is the other one? One, I guess. I can't see it on my screen. Nobody's picking those other two options. Those options could be improved to make to improve the quality of the instrument, uh, quality of this test, this test question. Next slide, please. Can we have the next slide? Okay. What do you think of this question here? Uh, option four, which is the 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 reddish, maroonish, the curve is going down. Option three, uh, the curve is going up. And what do you think of this question? So I'm going to go ahead and launch the, the poll. And we'll wait for our responses to come in. And we're going to go ahead and close the polling now. Ooh, good. Terrible question. Absolutely correct. Back to the slide. People who get the question correct are getting it wrong. People who, I'm sorry, people who are high ability in the fourth score group are getting it wrong, and people in the first score group are getting it correct. That's the opposite of what you would expect. Now, and we can summarize this, by the way, with these, that statistic in the upper right, I have RIT. This is the correlation of the item with the total test score, and it's a negative number. It's called a point by serial correlation. We can, that's a little shorthand for basically pointing out that that red curve, maroon curve, is going downward, not upward. Now, if you look at curve three, the, the bluish one, notice that's going up nicely. That's what we would have preferred. I bet you this has the wrong answer key. Um, and so I would, I would urge, as a psychometrician, I said, let's go back and look at that question. Perhaps it's the wrong, key. the answer key is wrong. In which case, this is a, not a bad question. It could be better. Again, we have a couple of options that nobody's selecting. Uh, but this, the statistics help us identify there may be a simple, easily corrected flaw in the question. One more question, please. What do you think of this question? This is a trick question. Paul, please. All right. You guys can go ahead and vote now. Okay. We, we kind of flashed that question a little quickly. Basically, the, uh, 
the likely the curve was pretty flat for the correct response. That is, the low ability people and the high ability people tended to have roughly the same percentage. Okay, looks like um, we'll let a couple more people vote. Looks like they're still coming in. And we're going to close the poll now and show the results. Ooh, I didn't trick you at all. Excellent. Uh, back to the question. The, the correct answer is maybe okay under some circumstances. Uh, if this was a question that I wanted to use to rank order people, like on the GMAT exam, uh, it's a terrible question. Everybody has the same likelihood of getting it correct. But if this is a question on a pass-fail exam or a certification exam, and it's a critical piece of information, and if you don't get this right, you don't deserve to pass. So if this is uh, brain surgery and the surgeon didn't put the tools away correctly or didn't clean up after himself or didn't wash his hands before the surgery, you don't want them. So there are a lot of questions like that that uh, are quite appropriate in certain, cir certain circumstances. Again, it's the, the need of the, the type of the test that's critical here. Okay, I think we have one last question. What do you think of this one? So I'll, I'll let you guys uh, take a look at that, and I'm going to launch the poll. Looks like people are putting their responses in, so we'll go another second or so. All right, we're going to go ahead and close that poll and sh share the results. Excellent. I would say 87% of you are now apprentice psychometricians. Uh, it's a good question. Can we see the question again? There we go. Okay. Uh, the likelihood of getting it correct goes up with ability. The, four op the other three options are pretty similar going down. Uh, this looks like a pretty good question. Uh, maybe a little easy, but depends on the circumstances. So we kind of like that question. Next slide, please. Now, we were talking about the point by serial correlation is the correlation of getting it right or wrong with the total score. This can be done in Excel. It's a fairly simple statistic, and it gives you really clear, good quality information. Again, if it's negative, you have a problem. If it's close to zero, you have to think through what's this question about. Now, and psychometricians go a little bit further. We had divided the ability spectrum into four groups. Uh, psychometricians like to think of the ability spectrum as a continuum. We have the next slide. And this is a curve from item response theory. And I just pointed out a couple of things here. Uh, here we're relating the uh, ability, which is on the x-axis. And rather than percent that we observe getting it correct, we have a formula to help us compute a probability of a correct response. We get these curves for each question by basic, basically modeling. And there's different models that we can use. You've heard of ROS, you've heard of three parameter, and there's other type of models out there. This is a curve from a three parameter item response theory. Uh, and what we've got is three parameters that we're concerned with. If you look at where this question is, goes from low to high, it's about ability level of plus one standard deviation. So within the range of zero to two, this question does a fairly good job of differentiating examinees. Above two, stand, two standard deviations above the average, uh, almost everyone's going to get it correct, and everybody below average is going to most likely going to get it incorrect. And we have this lower asymptote of about 0.2 because it's a multiple choice question. So if we have the next slide, here's another question. This one is very similar to the last one, except the whole curve is shifted to the left. You need less ability to do well on the question. And again, there's a band of interest for, this, for the question. So if you're designing uh, a GMAT exam, you want a whole lot of questions across the spectrum so you can accurately pinpoint where examinees are. If you're developing a pass-fail exam, this question is partially good. I mean, clearly, let's say your passing score is about around plus one standard deviation above the mean. 
that is about uh, well, it's about it's around plus one. Clearly, people who are at the low end are identified, but people who are below satisfactory but pretty good are are going to get this question correct. So it has limited utility, uh, but definitely does have utility in a certification exam. And one last question. Next one. This one doesn't differentiate anybody. And the likelihood of getting it correct is pretty low across the board. So again, this might be a critical piece of information and very few people have it, although that's kind of unlikely, unless the course was really poorly taught. Or this is a bad question. Uh, most likely it's a bad question. So basically, that this is the kind of process that we psychometricians go through. Uh, what I didn't stress enough, and Mika did a good job of, is talking about the content. The content of the test is critical. Developing the test specifications, knowing what the test is about is absolutely important. Uh, can we have the next slide? Uh, you want a test that has good proven test questions, not the misleading ones, not trick questions. Generally, the longer the test, the more uh, reliable it's going to be, and the more reliable it's be, the more likely it's going to be valid. Uh, so what psychometricians can use help you identify how long your test really needs to be. Again, we like to work with data. And then you would like alternate forms that are equivalent. That is, they end up, you can get to the same scaled score regardless of which form you took. And so that's what we do. I uh, hopefully you're intrigued enough and you will find a psychometrician and take them out for lunch. Larry, thank you so much. Um, we will let you put some other questions in the queue. I'm going to go back to Mika's presentation because there were some questions in the queue that I did not see. Um, so let me ask some of the some of the questions up here. Um, are a little bit hard to read. Um, sorry, guys. I'm having a hard time reading these. Um, Steve, can you help me with some of these? Because I can't, can't quite see the questions. Maybe you can unmute. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. So, um, yeah. Let's see here. If I blow this up, there are um, one of the questions was I've heard people referring to higher stakes exam. Can you comment on the use of this term, higher with E R capitalized at the end of that? Is that something Nika you've seen? So not high stakes, but high little case and then capital I think that's, E R. That's um everyone's attempt to kind of wiggle. I think, as I said, the, the stakes of an exam is in many ways a subjective judgment. I think there are going to be a lot of exams, as you saw in the poll questions, where we might not all agree on what those stakes are. There are going to be some exams where everyone agrees these are low stakes or these are high stakes. But there are quite a number of exams where there might be some disagreement about, OK, is this really high stakes? So. For example, a certification exam for air traffic controllers. I think most of us would agree that's really high stakes. What are the consequences if something goes wrong? And you saw on Larry's slide where you have that cut score, you may have people who should have passed but didn't. If some, something like an air traffic controllers exam, what you really want to minimize are people who shouldn't be passing but are passing because that's a really high stakes exam. Planes go down if you've got incompetent people uh, doing that. So I think everyone would agree that that's a high stakes exam. Something like a college or graduate school admissions exam, those of us who have worked in those programs usually refer to them as high stakes exams because there's a fair amount riding on whether you can get into college or graduate school. On the other hand, probably people who do air traffic controllers tests would say small potatoes compared to life or death decisions that would happen with some of these exams. So I think the term higher stakes is just used as a, a waffling word to indicate they're up at that end of the spectrum. It's not a three-point scale where you're either 
low, mid, or high. It really is a spectrum, and higher just means towards the high end of that spectrum. Great. And if I may, so, I, I can see the questions now. Um, so okay. let me ask one for let me ask one for Larry. And this is how the passing score set for the GRE, GMAT, and similar exams is it regularly adjusted? Sorry, we don't have a passing score. We don't publish at the publisher. Uh, we recognize that it's these these individual programs that need to set their own passing score. Uh, and we don't encourage a single score being used because of all those people on the upper left who would have succeeded uh, regardless. So we encourage schools to identify the level that they need and then go use other, that's only going to help them with the academic part. And then admissions people need to look through and say, all right, who's motivated, who's going to be tenacious, who's going to work hard as a student. Uh, so, no, we do not publish uh, passing scores, nor does the GRE or any large-scale admissions test. Okay. Um, let's look at another. Here's another question. Is a summative state assessment considered low stakes if it has grade, advance, grade advancement and graduation? Uh, yes, if grade advancement and graduation are not tied to the assessment. Uh, a state assessment? Yes. Is that what the question was? Um, yeah. Again, I think the stakes are often in the in the eyes of, of the users. I would say what does attach to the outcome of the assessment. If it doesn't have an impact on grade advancement, if it doesn't have an impact on graduation, um, I would want to know what it does have an impact on. I haven't heard anything in that description that would indicate that there's much of a stakes in it. However, some state assessments are used um, for teacher evaluation purposes. So you have to look at the stakes not only for the examinees, but perhaps for other groups as well. So if you have a state uh, assessment in K-12 education where what's essentially going on is you're comparing uh, success from school to school and you're identifying whether the schools are going to get funding or whether teachers are going to get contracts renewed, then that becomes very high stakes indeed not for the test takers, but for their teachers. If I can add, consider uh, the 12th grade NAEP assessments. These are mm -hmm. given in the spring. These are kids who are about to graduate. They could care less, and so they put minimal effort in there. Um, so, you know, we would encourage policymakers not to make this a high-stakes assessment. Do not evaluate your teachers and your programs based on this type of an assessment. That said, almost every state assessment, the results are high stakes for principals and schools and teachers, and low stakes for the people actually answering the questions. So right, and that's as I, I just like to agree with Larry on that one. That's not a good combination. If if they're low stakes for the people taking the assessments and they don't have much of a motivation to do their best on the exam, then you've got a problem attaching high stakes to that exam. It's not a problem if the, if there aren't high stakes attached to the exam. If it's, hey, let's see where you are, maybe the teacher will tweak the curriculum a little bit, then, you know, lack of motivation on the part of the students might not be such a bad thing. But if it's the teacher, the number of teachers in the school is going to get cut based on it, then you really want the students to be motivated. And if I can, not to belabor this one question, but... Uh, <laughs> One true example we had with the GMAT, we launched a whole new section, and we pre-tested the question ahead of time with people that were not taking the test for real. That gave us some data, but we were totally unable to use that data for uh, as pre-calibrated high-quality statistics. We used them as rough data to help us develop somewhat parallel forms, and then after motivated test takers took the test, we go back and we actually compute their real score. Uh, so it's a whole part of the, you need motivated test takers to get actual quality statistics. So um, we are getting to the close of our webinar. There's, there's a lot of good questions here. Um, but, you know, what we'll try to do is answer them in our follow-up email to our participants. I did want to offer a gift to our attendees today and you can choose one or both of these gifts. 
This first one is online item writing training, and it is um, a new training that that the, that Cavion recently developed, and it will be good for two weeks. It'll take you about an hour's worth of time to complete. Um, you, the URL for this is training.cavion.net, and the code word when you get to that URL will be online14. Um, so this is a great first step into training item writers how to um, create items correctly. It's, it's a good refresher for those of us who do know how to write items. I think you'll find it entertaining as well as educational. This, the second gift to you is a 30-minute needs analysis. Our partner with our webinar today is ExcelSoft, and um, with this URL, we will, if you log on to this URL and register, they will provide to you a 30-minute consultation at no cost to help you kind of look at your test development and delivery needs um, to implement or make changes to a test delivery platform. Um, we will be sending both of these URLs in our thank you follow-up message. And we thank you for your time today. I'll go to the next slide now, and uh, we can uh, just provide some helpful resources for you. As I mentioned um, earlier, I think that you can join us in our LinkedIn group, Caveon Test Security, or follow us uh, at Twitter on Twitter using the at Caveon um, tag. Um, we also, as, as I mentioned earlier um, at the beginning of the webinar, if you would like to look at the slides and recording for this webinar, this is the URL that you can go to to get that information. Again, we have um, articles on test integrity at caveon.com slash CITN, Cheating in the News. Our blog is posted once a week, and our newsletter um, goes out about once a month. Thank you so much for attending, and as I mentioned earlier in our session, um, I want to give a special thanks to our presenters today, um, Dr. Rudner and Dr. Hoffman. Um, lots of good questions came up and really appreciate their presentation. Our upcoming webinars that we have coming up uh, are Caveon's Lessons Learned from ATP, and this will be held on February 20th, Wednesday, February 20th. And then the next webinar in the online education series will be Designing Assessments for Online Education, and that will be held March 20th. Again, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate your attendance and look forward to a follow-up email from us with further information. Thank you.